Um, good morning. Happy Thursday, PAs, W staff, clients, friends joining us. So hope you guys had a good holiday, Martin Luther King holiday on Monday. No film scoring assignment this week, but we are revisiting a film score that we looked at a few years ago. One of the best film scores of all time, a classic Spielberg movie. Um, and we're going to get right into to seeing the assignment. And then you're going to see your results that you came up with a few few years ago tomorrow. We're going to revisit uh, results for that. So today, let's let's go back in time and let's take a look at the great Spielberg film E.T. He's a 1982 American fantasy, science fiction-like film um, directed by Spielberg and written by Melissa Matheson. And um, it tells the story of this little, little kid, Elliot, who, who befriends this extraterrestrial, E.T., um, who's stranded on, on Earth. And it's a, it's a lovely little story between the, the two. It was, it was based on a character that Spielberg invented when he was a little kid while his parents were going through a divorce so it's a personal film of spielberg and when when you think or you know when i think of big directors george lucas spielberg these guys make you know billions of dollars generate billions of billions of dollars and there's there's sometimes it's easy to sort of say well that's just commercial and there's nothing personal about that and even I've said that too, but there is something personal. These guys, especially Spielberg, they're making films that that they wanted to see when they were kids growing up and that either they weren't there yet or they had to create them themselves, but they created their own fantasy world for all of us. So um, they are deep, they are personal films in a sense where, um, and so sometimes you, I just lose, I, you know, we lose track of commercial meaning a sellout or not personal but they can be personal. And this film was probably maybe his most personal. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the film and about the music, this John Williams uh, soundtrack. Then we're gonna look at the scene and your assignment and my assignment. So um, so let's get into it. So E.T., I mean, probably one of his highest grossing films of all time. It held the, it held the record for 11 years until Jurassic Park came out. That that. You know, made a little bit more money but uh, this movie was shot for 10.5 million dollars it, it's made 792 million dollars it's almost a billion dollars and um, it's uh, it, it was shot mostly all in Culver City where the original King Kong was filmed and gone with the wind and you know those studios are still there today unlike most films it was shot in chronological order and the um, perspective is from the, the children's angle uh, Spielberg again uses the filming technique if you remember, he used that filming technique in Jaws where um, the camera would be under the water or over it, and that was a very unsettling feeling. So here he's using the camera again in an effective way where if you're a kid, you're shorter than everybody, right? I mean, uh, or, you know, if you're a little person, you're, you're looking up all the time. And he's using the camera as kind of a POV, a point of view of, of and that's how... Um, people, you know, that are smaller, shorter, view the world. And so he's like, well, what if, you know, instead of the camera here, what if we move it here? And what does the world look like down here? You know, it's, um, there's that great scene in Dead Poet Society when uh, Robin Williams, who's the teacher at this all boys school, tells uh, them to stand on top of their desk. And, you know, they're confused about why you know, what's the point of this? But he's like, well, you get a different perspective all of a sudden. And then with a different perspective and view, your your um, reality becomes different. Your thinking becomes a little different, even if it's unconscious. So if Spielberg's moving the camera down below, now the reality is different. You see um, taller people talking. You can't hear them, perhaps, or whatever. There's a whole new world uh, exploration and discovery available. So um, cool, again, you know, he's a brilliant filmmaker, and these are all little subtleties that go into making the film that um, proved to be, you know, very effective. So, um, of course, Spielberg calls on his friend and brilliant composer, John Williams. They collaborate again on this. And John Williams, of course, got his start and fame along with Spielberg for Jaws. And here, this score sounds nothing like Jaws. Jaws was scary, a two-note motif, ostinato. 
here it's complete fantasy and magical it's full orchestra it has harps and celesta to kind of evoke a childhood like you know those bells and and everything so um it's uh it's a lovely score uh and spielberg did something really unusual usually you know filmmakers film the movie uh, they put a temp score to it, and then they give it to the composer. The composer writes to the picture, frame by frame. Um, so when they were recording the, the scene that we're going to be scoring, when they were recording that, something wasn't really working in the recording session that John Williams was conducting. And uh, Spielberg went over to him and said, okay, well, why don't you just conduct it, compose it, do it the way you hear it, and I'll, I'll edit to the music. This is rarely done. I mean, it, it may be more now, but I mean, th that's very not traditional, especially for a director, you know, a director's ego, because usually, you know, the director always has the final say. That's that's what it is. But I think Spielberg trusted John Williams' musical instinct and uh, film instinct to to say, OK, what well, you do it the way you want to do it, you be you you do it. And then I'll I'll edit the sequence to the music. So that's that's really rare. Uh, but it shows that Spielberg is such a good collaborator and such a brilliant filmmaker. What's best for the movie? The score is beautiful, and and this chase scene works so well with the score. So it's just uh, that was it's very cool. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, John Williams' score. So we haven't really talked about modes yet in music. We've talked about modal jazz with Miles Davis, where there's not really um, a key center. Okay, so. Again, we're going to reference the greatest jazz album, the largest one, Kind of Blue. Now, we've listened to So What almost, you know, in every week we listen to this. And we again, we come back to it. So So What is, you know, two chords for the most part. It, it's four chords total, but it's, it's kind of these two. So there's no tonal center, really. What John Williams is doing is using polytonality. And polytonality refers to two different keys being played at the same time, okay? We won't go too technical into this, but you have uh, like you have the key of C. Remember we talked about Billy, Bill Evans. We had the root note, right? C is the root note. Um, so if you're in the key of C and you can go to the key of D and you can play the C chord and a D chord at the same time. And if you do that, you come up with, you get a, a mode. So there's seven musical modes. And this mode that he's using is the Lydian mode. The Lydian is like a major scale, except with a raised fourth. So if we have a C major scale, it's gonna be C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. So it's a major scale, except the fourth is raised to an F sharp. That gives it this sound of, it's a happy sound. It's used in film scores all the time. So. Why do we have modes? Is this just fancy music theory talk? No, we have modes because they evoke different emotions in the score. So many times I don't write my music really thinking I'm going to do it in this mode. I just kind of, but I, I think of it afterwards. So it, each mode presents different um, different emotions. So if there, like I said, there's seven modes. So you could, uh, if we went through each mode, you would hear the difference and. We could, but I, I don't want to deviate too much of the assignment. But what John Williams is using is polytonality. Two, two keys going on at the same time. So kind of a C chord and a D chord going on simultaneously. L let's listen to the scene with John Williams' score, and we'll, um, we'll, uh, then we'll hear it without the music. Okay.
So with the music, it's beautiful, right? Everyone knows that theme. It's gorgeous how it starts when the bikes leave the ground. That's when it sounds, the music sounds like you're flying along with them. It's uh, such a fun uh, moment in cinema history. So iconic and cool. And the music makes it so magical. And it kind of makes you want to be a kid again, writing or, you know, it evokes that. Okay, let's listen to it without the music. So I hope you enjoyed that review of that great, um, the great film and the great score by John Williams. Cool to see the Lydian mode that he used, that, that I try to explain that, you know, hopefully okay to you guys, just so you can hear, even though you're coming up with your own scores, just so you can hear what the original composer did. And it was cool that Spielberg edited to John Williams' music, um, and that's the brilliance of a collaboration, when collaborations work so well together, and Spielberg and Williams you know, have been just masters at that, uh, and have changed cinema. So, um, so that's that. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the class. And then tomorrow, uh, we're going to see your results that you came up with. This was an easy week for us because we didn't have a new assignment and you had a holiday, but I still like to go back and show you the progress you've made. So, um, I will see you tomorrow. So have a great rest of the day. Okay. Bye. <music>